Americans. When it comes to corporations operating without any regard to human health and safety, the Nestle Corporation really seems to be in a league all of its own. What's going on with this company? Nestle is the largest food and beverage corporation in the entire world. They own over 2,000 different brands and sell chocolate, cereal, coffee, baby food, water, ice cream, and so much more. In fact, it would be difficult to go shopping and not buy something that's owned by Nestle. And yet, the company is accused of some truly horrific things, including child slavery, killing babies, exploiting the poor, claiming water shouldn't be a human right, and countless other scandals. So, what's the truth? And if Nestle really is this evil, how are they getting away with it? This video is a journey into the dark world of Nestle, a look behind the curtain at one of the most controversial companies ever. But to understand the story of Nestle, we first need to go back to the man who started it all. The story of Nestle begins with the birth of a boy in Frankfurt in 1814. Henry Nestle was the 11th of 14 children and was born into a family of glaziers where the trade of cutting and fitting glass had been passed down from father to son for many generations. However, as Henry got older, he became fascinated with chemistry and decided he wanted to become a pharmacist instead of going into the family trade, which caused a bit of a rift between him and his dad. But Henry was determined to follow his own path, and at 15, he began working as a pharmacist's apprentice before later leaving his hometown in Germany to go and live in Switzerland, where he worked on concocting medicines and chemical experiments. It was here in Switzerland that Henry would start one of the biggest corporations in the world. In fact, to this day, Vevey in Switzerland remains the headquarters of Nestle. But it wasn't until much later in his life that Henry started Nestle. Before his big break, Henry tried all kinds of different entrepreneurial ideas. It all began when Henry read a report that infant mortality had become extremely high because many women couldn't breastfeed their children or their children were allergic to the milk. Henry realized this massive problem was also a big opportunity. There was clearly a major need for an artificial alternative to breastfeeding that could save countless babies' lives. Henry began to study all the existing information about breast milk and conduct a series of experiments in his lab with various different ingredients. But saving children's lives wasn't the only thing that pushed Henry day and night to find a breast milk substitute. His own tragedy also played a part, as Henry's wife had had many health issues of her own and thus was unable to give birth. So as a way to channel her maternal instincts, she became extremely concerned about other people's babies and pushed Henry to create a breast milk substitute that could save lives. And by 1867, he'd succeeded. Henry had created one of the first ever baby formulas, essentially a formulated mixture of cow's milk, flour, and sugar, which could be a substitute to natural breast milk. Henry then created a company called Nestle to begin selling it. And so you see, Nestle began with such great intentions, a humble guy creating a life-saving product for babies who couldn't breastfeed naturally. Unfortunately, this isn't a heartwarming success story. If anything, this is a horror movie. You see, whilst baby food was the product that started Nestle's dominance, it was also the product that would later destroy lives and create an international scandal. And as Nestle grew into a giant conglomerate, they became shrouded in all kinds of dark controversies. But we'll get to that. At first, Henry's new baby formula was a big success. Orders were coming in so quickly that Henry had to open up a factory to keep up with the demand. He couldn't believe it. Everything was happening so fast and money was pouring in. With the huge success of this first product, Henry then partnered with a Swiss chocolatier to create another new product. And in 1875, they created the first chocolate milk. In the space of just a couple of years, Henry went from being a small, unknown pharmacist in Switzerland to one of the richest men in the country. And Nestle was growing more and more every month. But, in a way, it was all a bit too much for Henry, who was entering the final stages of his life and wanted to relax and spend more time with his wife. And so, a few years later, Henry decided to retire and sell his company. And this is where things get really interesting. You see, the new owners who took over Nestle had big plans to expand the company. And in 1905, they merged with a rival business who sold similar products called Anglo-Swiss. And together, they became known as the Nestle Group. By pooling all their resources together instead of competing, it allowed them to more easily dominate the market and expand their product lines. By the 1920s, Nestle was creating new chocolates and different beverages. And by 1938, they'd created the first mass market coffee. Their timing was great, as instant coffee helped keep soldiers awake during the Second World War, and thus it became included in all emergency rations of every US soldier. 
As well as creating new products, the Nestle Group quite often just acquired other companies they saw potential in, or that they thought could be serious competition. And so, as the years went by, Nestle's list of products grew and grew, and so did their wealth and power. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough for them. And behind the scenes, a plan was being hatched. A plan that would make millions of dollars, but risk millions of lives. When Henry Nestle first created his baby formula back in 1867, the whole idea was a supplement to help mothers who couldn't breastfeed their children, certainly not to try and replace breast milk altogether. And the reason for that is studies have shown that natural breast milk is healthier than any formula. Natural breast milk is widely recommended by the World Health Organization, American Medical Association, UNICEF, and countless others. So for a while, baby formula was sold simply as an alternative for those who needed it. But in the 1970s, roughly a hundred years after the company first began, sales seemed to be slowing down, and Nestle started to get greedy. They wondered, what if we could sell this baby formula to all mothers, not just those who actually need it? You see, despite all the other products Nestle had launched, Baby Formula was still one of Nestle's biggest money makers, and that's because it has very high profit margins. So imagine how much more money they could make if they could expand their market to all mothers. So Nestle began a campaign to undermine breast milk, and aggressively advertised their Baby Formula as being superior, manipulating mothers into believing Nestle's formula was a necessity for the health of their babies, and that it would be better for their child than breastfeeding, when in reality, the ever was the opposite. Nestle's formula was vastly inferior to natural milk, as it lacked many of the nutrients that helped babies fight off disease and keep them healthy. By encouraging mothers to switch when they didn't need to, it was putting their babies at a higher risk of infection and malnutrition. In order to make sure mothers believed this information though, Nestle began paying off doctors and hospitals to peddle their formula by asking them to tell mothers it was better than breastfeeding. Nestle then ramped this up further in Africa and Asia, where they would hire saleswomen to dress up like nurses and convince mothers to give up breastfeeding and use their formula instead. These saleswomen were paid on commission, meaning the more formula they sold, the more money they made, thus encouraging them to sell the formula very aggressively which they did. These saleswomen, posing as genuine nurses, would walk the halls of maternity wards, or even visit mothers at their homes unannounced and sell them on Nestle's baby formula. And it gets much worse. Nestle got these fake nurses to hand out free samples of their formula to mothers. Except, they gave them just enough samples that by the time the samples ran out, the mothers would have stopped producing milk naturally, and thus had no choice but to pay for Nestle's expensive product to keep their child alive. This proved to be very successful and profitable for Nestle, and so they expanded this plan to many other locations, but especially developing nations, where many of the women weren't educated enough to know the information they were being fed wasn't true. After all, if a woman who appears to be a qualified nurse is telling you that your baby needs this product, you're just gonna believe them. Of course, the consequences were fatal. It's estimated millions of babies died or were made severely deficient in essential nutrients because of this. The worst impact was in third world countries where there was no access to clean water. The big problem was that the baby formula had to be mixed with water, and yet Nestle was convincing people they needed to use this baby formula in places where clean water was in very short supply. So the formula was getting mixed with water that was polluted and contaminated, thus making the babies ill. To make matters even worse, because many of these women couldn't afford to keep buying the baby formula that their babies now depended on, they instead diluted it with even more water, which meant that the babies didn't get enough of the nutrients they needed from the formula, leading to malnutrition. It didn't help that the instructions on the packaging were in English, which most of the mothers in these countries couldn't read, so they didn't even realise that by diluting it so much, they were starving their children. This also meant many of them didn't know they needed to boil the water first to prevent bacteria making their babies sick. For a while, Nestle did nothing about any of this, and seemed to be getting away with it all. But then in 1974, a publication entitled The Baby Killer specifically called out the serious consequences of aggressively pushing baby formula in these countries. Nestle was listed for its involvement in creating a need that didn't exist before, then convincing consumers the product was necessary, and then getting them hooked on it, all whilst completely ignoring the tragic consequences. When this was translated into German by Swiss campaigners, it was given the very blunt title, Nestle Kills Babies, which led to Nestle taking legal action against them. But it was all too late. All this coverage created an international scandal for Nestle, and boycotts were launched against them in numerous countries. 
Despite this, the company remained quiet on the issue. However, they couldn't run from this. In 1978, Nestle executives were brought before the US Senate for questioning about the impact of Nestle's formula milk on all of these sick or dying infants. Would you agree with me that your product should not be used where there is uh, impure water? Yes or no? Uh, we give all the instructions. Just, just, to just answer. What would you? What of is your position? Of course not. But we cannot cope not. with that. Well, as I understand, what you say is where there's impure water, it should not be used. Yes. Where the people are so poor that they're not going to realistically be able to continue to purchase that, and which is going to mean that they're going to dilute it to a point, yes. which is going to endanger the health, that it should not be used. Yes. I all believe right. Now, then, then my final question is: Is what do you do? Or what do you feel is your corporate responsibility to find out the extent of the, the use of your product in those circumstances in the developing part of the world? Do you feel that you have any responsibility? We can't have that responsibility, sir. May I make a reference to... Uh, you can't have that responsibility? No. And soon after, new regulations were introduced by the World Health Organization that said companies couldn't compare breast milk with formula milk alternatives in their ads. Whilst this helped in well-regulated countries, in much of Southeast Asia and the Pacific, the regulations and laws were not so well enforced, meaning Nestle doubled down on their marketing in many of these underdeveloped countries with less restrictions. And thus, their sales continued to increase. Meanwhile, back in places like the US, where sales had stalled, Nestle tried to change their tarnished image and promote breast milk by using some very bizarre ads featuring something called the Super Babies. The idea was to try and distance themselves from the negative media attention they'd received by making out like they'd totally changed. Despite the fact, they were still using the same exploitative tactics to push their formula in countries where they could still get away with it. Even as recently as 2018, a report by Save the Children found the health of millions of vulnerable children were being put at risk because of the aggressive marketing tactics used by Nestle and several other giant corporations. And yet, despite all of the extremely serious problems their tactics have caused, I'm sorry to say that when it comes to Nestle's dark past, we're only just getting started. taking the water that should not be owned by anybody. Trying to steal water everywhere from Brazil to Flint, Michigan. In 2005, the Nestle CEO implied that having access to water wasn't a basic human right. Das Wasser zu einem uh, um, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt, als Mensch sollten sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extremlösung. Ja? After the media criticized him for this, he later backtracked. But to see how he really feels, we can simply look at Nestle's actions when it comes to water. For example, in Pakistan in 2013, Nestle began diverting clean drinking water away from villages and towns and then began bottling it in their factories and selling it back to the same people they took the water from, but at a much, much higher price. The big issue is that Nestle had taken so much water that thousands were forced to drink dirty sludge water instead because these people couldn't afford to buy the expensive bottled water, which, remember, was theirs to begin with. Nestle's strategy was essentially to deprive people of a necessity like clean water and then supply them an expensive alternative. Since Nestle arrived in the country, there are claims they have sucked the land dry and caused water levels to sink hundreds of feet. And it's not just in developing countries where Nestle does this. For example, in America, when California was suffering from droughts, many companies moved their operations out of the state, but not Nestle. In the midst of this very serious water shortage, Nestle Waters continued to pump 705 million gallons of fresh water from California's national parks, draining some of the state's remaining water resources to sell back to Californians. And when asked about this, the Nestle Waters CEO said that if he could bottle more of California's water for profit during the drought, he would. Likewise in Michigan, it was reported Nestle pumped 747 litres of fresh water every minute out of the state reserves. Nestle caused a drastic reduction in the state's water levels. A judge eventually ordered Nestle to stop its operations due to the ecological harm they were causing. 
Whilst it's perhaps not widely known, the reality is Nestle has the largest bottled water operation in the world and owns over 50 brands of bottled water. So Nestle are actually incentivized to target places with limited clean water available from their own natural resources because if they buy up lots of the natural water supplies and create a shortage, it creates massive demand. But perhaps where Nestle got a lot of their inspiration was the classic British show Only Fools and Horses. In one episode, the characters decide to sell bottled water by claiming it came from a natural spring when really it just came straight out of the tap. Now, this show was a comedy, but Nestle decided to basically do that in real life. Nestle has simply bottled up water that comes from the exact same municipal supplies as tap water and advertised it as coming from Clear Mountain Springs, thus allowing them to add a huge markup to the price. When, in fact, they can buy a tank of this water for $10, use it to fill thousands of plastic bottles, and resell this glorified tap water for an estimated $50,000. world's poorest countries, around one in four children are engaged in child labour. When you pick up a chocolate bar, probably the last thing on your mind is how that chocolate bar was made. But the brutal truth is that Nestle has been found to use forced labour and even child slavery on the farms where the cocoa beans are harvested. And for a while, this cheap exploitative labour went mostly unnoticed, leading to low costs and high profits. But then in the year 2000, a report came out that said Nestle was guilty of buying blood chocolates, and that Nestle was fully aware that enslaved children were working on their plantations. Now, this was also true for many of the big chocolate companies. So in the year 2000, Nestle, Cadbury, and Mars all promised to make their chocolate slave-free by 2005. Except, they didn't. In fact, in 2005, the International Labour Rights Fund filed a lawsuit against Nestle and other chocolate manufacturing companies on behalf of three Malian children, alleging the children were trafficked to the Ivory Coast, forced into slavery, and frequently beaten on the chocolate plantation. Nestle's response to incidents like this was always the same. They said it was impossible to keep track of everything going on on these plantations, but they vowed to try and improve the situation. But then a few more years passed, and it seemed like nothing had really changed. In 2010, a documentary called The Dark Side of Chocolate brought attention to the media about how children were being stolen away from their homes and families and being forced to work on plantations for very little or no money at all. Then, an investigation in 2020 discovered that children as young as eight were picking coffee on the farms of one of Nestle's suppliers. It was reported children worked seven days a week carrying sacks that weighed twice their weight and got paid around one dollar an hour for their work. However, once again, Nestle denied knowledge of this and said they tried to fix it. And to be fair here, this is a complex issue that's certainly not limited just to Nestle. But in 2002, Nestle was demanding $6 million from the government of Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries on the planet. The conflict dated back to the 1970s, when a military regime in Ethiopia seized all the assets of foreign companies and nationalized them. And then many years after this, one of those companies that had had its assets seized was acquired by Nestle, who were now demanding compensation. Now remember, this was a business that was nationalized under a different government 27 years ago, and a business which Nestle didn't even own at the time. But still, to be fair to Nestle here, technically they were entitled to claim compensation. But here's the issue. At the time they were making this demand for $6 million, Ethiopia was facing an extreme famine that threatened the lives of 15 million people. The country was in extreme poverty, with many citizens making less than $100 a year. That $6 million could help provide clean water to millions of Ethiopians. It could quite literally save lives. But despite being aware of this, and despite the fact Nestle made around $65 billion in sales that same year, Nestle initially refused to let Ethiopia off the hook, and persistently demanded the money. Even though $6 million was nothing to Nestle, they said it was the principle of the matter that was important. However, once the media picked the story up, and people started threatening to boycott Nestle, they immediately did a U-turn, and settled the debt for $1.5 million instead, and vowed to reinvest it into the country's economy. But it seems pretty clear if it wasn't for the potential PR nightmare, they had no intention of backing down. And if you thought Nestle's controversies ended there, think again. In 2012, the Competition Bureau raided the offices of Nestle to investigate price fixing, claiming Nestle was making deals with other chocolate companies to ensure they all kept their prices equally high so they didn't undercut each other and give customers a better deal. Nestle denied any collusion, but eventually settled for a $9 million settlement the following year. Ordinarily, this might be quite a big controversy, but in the context of everything else they've been accused of, it doesn't even seem that bad comparatively. Because of all these scandals Nestle have been involved in, many people have tried to boycott Nestle products. 
But the company is so vast that it's incredibly difficult because there's just so many different products they sell. They have reach in almost every country with products in so many different categories. When you buy food, water, or even cosmetics, without realizing it, you may be buying from a Nestle brand. Which is probably why despite all of these controversies, Nestle has continued to grow and make more acquisitions to become even more powerful. And to be fair, I'm sure there are many people working at Nestle who just want to make good products in a perfectly ethical way. The issue is that when Henry Nestle founded the company, he was solving a very genuine problem. But unfortunately, as Nestle grew, their business model later started creating problems instead so they could sell you the solution. Of course, when you've been around for hundreds of years and owned so many brands, I guess some scandals are kind of inevitable. Just ask Coca-Cola. To see the disturbing history of Coke, just click right here. I'll hopefully see you there. Cheers.